Okay, so we are finishing chapter seven today. And remember, um, Heidi has gone out of the house and she's run downtown looking for the tower with the gold ball on top. Now, she doesn't know where she is or how to get back to her home, but she finds this boy and she asks him and he says, well, what will you give me if I tell you where it is? And she doesn't have anything. And so she says, well, I mean, what do you want? And this is where we pick up. Money. I have none, but Clara has. I'm sure she will give me some. How much do you want? Two pence. Come along then. They started off together along the street, and on the way, Heidi asked her companion what he was carrying on his back. It was a hand organ, he told her, which played beautiful music when he turned the handle. All at once, they found themselves in front of an old church with a high tower. The boy stood still and said, there it is. But how shall I get inside? asked Heidi, looking at the fast closed doors. I don't know, was the answer. Do you think that I can ring as they do for Sebastian? I don't know. Heidi had by this time caught sight of a bell in the wall, which she now pulled with all her might. If I go up, you must stay down here, for I do not know the way back, and you will have to show me. What will you give me then for that? What do you want me to give you? Another two pence. They heard the key turning inside, and then someone pulled up, open the creaking door. An old man came out and at first looked with surprise and then in anger at the children as he began scolding them. What do you mean by ringing me down like this? Can't you read what is written over the bell for those who wish to go up to the tower? The boy said nothing, but pointed at Heidi. The, and Heidi said, but I do want to go up to the tower. What do you want up there, said the old man. Has somebody sent you? No, replied Heidi. I only want to go up that I might look down. Get along home with you and don't try this trick on me again, or you may not come off as easily a second time. And with that, he turned and was about to shut the door. But Heidi took hold of his coat and said beseechingly, Please let me go up just once. <coughs> he looked around and his mood changed as he saw her pleading eyes. He took hold of her hand and said kindly, well, if you really wish it so much, I will take you. The boy sat down on the church steps to show that he was content to wait where he was. Hand in hand with the old man, Heidi went up the many steps of the tower. They became smaller and smaller as they neared the top. And at last came one very narrow one, and there they were at the end of their climb. The old man lifted Heidi up that she might look out of the open window. There, now you can look down, he said. Heidi saw beneath her a sea of roofs, towers, and chimney pots. She quickly drew back her head and said in a sad, disappointed voice, Oh, it's not at all what I thought. You see now, a child like you does not understand anything about a view. Come along down and don't go ringing at my bell again. He lifted her down and went on before her down the narrow stairway. To the left of the turn, where it grew wider, stood the door of the tower keeper's room, and the landing ran out beside it to the edge of the steep slanting roof. At the far end of this was a large basket, in front of which sat a big gray cat that snarled as it saw them, for she wished to warn the passers-by that they were not to meddle with her family. Heidi stood still and looked at her in astonishment for she had never seen such a monster cat before. There were whole armies of mice, however, in the old tower, so the cat had no difficulty in catching half a dozen for her dinner every day. The old man, seeing Heidi so struck with admiration, said, she will not hurt you while I am near. Come, you can have a look at the kittens. Heidi went up to the basket and broke out into expressions of delight. Oh, the sweet little things, these darling kittens, she kept on saying as she jumped from side to side of the basket so as not to lose any of the droll gambles of the seven or eight little kittens that were scrambling and rolling and falling over one another. Would you like to have one, said the old man, who enjoyed watching the child's pleasure. For myself to keep? said Heidi excitedly, who could hardly believe such happiness was to be hers. 
Well, yes, of course, more than one if you like. In short, you can take away the whole lot if you have room for them. For the old man was only too glad to think he could be rid of these kittens without any more trouble. Heidi could hardly contain herself for joy. There would be plenty of room for them in the large house. And then how astonished and delighted Clara would be when she saw those sweet little kittens. But how can I take them with me? asked Heidi and was going quickly to see how many she could carry away in her hands when the old cat sprang at her so fiercely that she shrank back in fear. I will take them for you if you will tell me where, said the old man, stroking the cat to quiet her, for she was an old friend of his that had lived with him in the tower for many years. To Air Seasman's, the big house where there's a gold dog's head on the door with a ring in its mouth, explained Heidi. Such full directions as these were not really needed by the old man, who had had charge of the tower for many a long year and knew every house far and near, and moreover, Sebastian was an acquaintance of his. I know the house, he said, but when shall I bring them, and who shall I ask for? You are not one of the family, I'm sure. No, but Clara will be so delighted when I take her the kittens. The old man wished now to go downstairs, but Heidi did not know how to tear herself away from the amusing spectacle. If I could just take one or two away with me, one for myself and one for Clara, may I? Well, wait a moment, said the man, and he drew the cat cautiously away into his room and leaving her by a bowl of food, came out again and shut the door. Now, take two of them. Heidi's eyes shone with delight. She picked up a white kitten and another striped white and yellow and put one in the right, the other in the left pocket. Then she went downstairs. The boy was still sitting outside on the steps, and as the old man shut the door of the church behind them, she said, which is our way to Air Seasman's house? I don't know, was the answer. Heidi began a description of the front door and the steps and the windows, but the boy only shook his head and was not any the wiser. Well, look here, continued Heidi. From one window, you can see a very, very large gray house, and the roof runs like this. And Heidi drew a zigzag line in the air with her forefinger. With this, the boy jumped up. He was evidently in the habit of guiding himself by similar landmarks. He ran straight off with Heidi after him, and in a very short time, they had reached the door with a large dog's head for the knocker. Heidi rang the bell. Sebastian opened it quickly, and when he saw it was Heidi, he said, Make haste, make haste, he cried in a hurried voice. Heidi sprang hastily in, and Sebastian shut the door after her, leaving the boy, whom he had not noticed, standing in wonder on the steps. Make haste, little miss, said Sebastian again. Go straight into the dining room. They are already at table. Fraulein Rottenmeier looks like a loaded cannon. What can make the little miss run off like that? Heidi walked into the room. The lady housekeeper did not look up. Clara did not speak. There was an uncomfortable silence. Sebastian pushed her chair up for her, and when she was seated, Fraulein Rottenmeier, with a severe countenance, sternly and solemnly addressed her. I will speak with you afterwards, Adelheid. Only this much will I say now, that you behaved in a most unmannerly and reprehensible way by running out of the house as you did, without asking permission, without anyone knowing a word about it. And then to go wandering about till this hour? I never heard of such behavior before. Moi, came the answer back. This was too much for the lady's temper. With raised hand, with raised voice, she exclaimed, You dare, Adelheid, after your bad behavior, to answer me as if it were a joke? I did not, began Heidi. Meow, meow. Sebastian almost dropped his dish and rushed out of the room. That will do, Fraulein Rottenmeier tried to say, but her voice was almost stifled with anger. Get up and leave the room. Heidi stood up frightened and again made an attempt to explain. I really did not. Meow, meow, meow. But Heidi now put in Clara. When you see that it makes Fraulein Rottenmeier angry, why do you keep on saying meow? It isn't I, it's the kittens. Heidi was at last given time to say. How, what, kittens? shrieked Fraulein Rottenmeier. Sebastian, Tanette, find the horrid little things. Take them away. 
and she rose and fled into the study and locked the door so as to make sure that she was safe from the kittens, which to her were the most horrible things in creation. Sebastian was obliged to wait a few minutes outside the door to get over his laughter before he went into the room again. He had, while serving Heidi, caught sight of a little kitten's head peeping out of her pocket and guessing the scene that would follow had been so overcome with amusement at the first meows that he had hardly been able to finish handing the dishes. The lady's distressed cries for help had ceased before he had sufficiently regained his composure to go back into the dining room. It was all peace and quietness there now. Clara had the kittens on her lap and Heidi was kneeling beside her, both laughing and playing with the tiny, graceful little animals. Sebastian, exclaimed Clara, Clara as he came in. You must help us. You must find a bed for the kittens where Fräulein Reitenmeier will not spy them out, for she is so afraid of them that she will send them away at once. But we want to keep them and have them out whenever we are alone. Where can you put them? I will see to that, answered Sebastian willingly. I will make a bed and a basket and put it in some place where the lady is not likely to go. You leave it to me. He set about the work at once, sniggling to himself the while, for he guessed there would be a further rumpus about this some day, and Sebastian was not without a certain pleasure in the thought of Fräulein Rottenmeier being a little disturbed. Not until some time had elapsed and it was nearing the hour for going to bed did Fräulein Rottenmeier venture to open the door a crack and call through. Have you taken those dreadful little animals away, Sebastian? He assured her twice that he had done so. He had been hanging about the room in anticipation of this question and now quickly and quietly caught up the kittens from Clara's lap and disappeared with them. The castigatory sermon, which Fräulein Rottenmeier had held in reserve for Heidi, was put off till the following day, as she felt too exhausted now, after all the emotions she had gone through of irritation, anger, and fright, of which Heidi had unconsciously been the cause. She retired without speaking, Clara and Heidi following, happy in their minds at knowing that the kittens were lying in a comfortable bed. <laughs> Heidi gets into a lot of trouble, but always because she's trying to do things to help people, it seems. All right, we will read chapter eight. Tomorrow, there is a great commotion in the large house. Okay, see you then. Bye-bye.